Well, Boris Johnson is going after what feels like a year's worth of events squeezed into 24 hours. What happens next? We're going to try and make sense of it all with our audience here in South Yorkshire. Welcome to Question Time from Barnsley. On tonight's panel, one of the new MPs elected in 2019, the first ever Conservative MP for the seat of Bishop Auckland in County Durham, and an early critic to declare no confidence in the Prime Minister, Deanna Davison. Labour's Shadow Education Secretary and a key part of Keir Starmer's team since he was elected leader, Bridget Philipson. The Daily Telegraph columnist, leader, writer and author, Tim Stanley. One of the new architects of New Labour, who was the chief spin doctor for Tony Blair, went back into number 10 Downing Street with Gordon Brown in the final days of the last Labour government and is now a podcaster, among other things, Alistair Campbell, and a musician who was in the award-winning band Mumford & Sons, who headlined Glastonbury in 2013. He left the band after a political row and is the second podcaster on our panel, Winston Marshall. Welcome to Barnsley, welcome to our panel, great to see you, welcome to our audience here, good to see you as well. And of course, welcome to you joining us, uh, watching at home, very good to have you with us. Do join in the conversation the usual way on social media, at BBC Question Time, we'll hear what you've got to say. So I don't think there'll be much surprise about our first topic this evening, but there are lots of other questions, important questions that you've answered, which I also want to get to later in the programme, so stay with us. Let's hear our first question now, which is from Adam, Adam Tees. So, um, with no real functioning government currently... What is going to happen next? Well, that is the question. What is going to happen next? Deanna? That is a big question and very much the question that's on all of our minds, I think, Adam, because unfortunately what has happened over the past six to eight months has been distraction. It's been a government that's been focused on, uh, unfortunately, on Boris Johnson, on events that have emerged out of Downing Street, on the kind of antics that have followed. And in my view, what we absolutely need now is focus on the issues that matter. Focus on the issues that matter to each one of us in this room. We're facing a cost of living crisis. We need to be talking about that. There's a war going on in Ukraine. We absolutely need to be talking about that. And unfortunately, focus of government has been lost. So in my view, what happens next, and I'm hoping it happens speedily, is that the Conservative Party elects a new leader who will become Prime Minister, and they will get on with the job. And you were a, a, a supporter of Boris Johnson uh, at the I, beginning. I didn't vote for him in the leadership contest, actually. Are you surprised by how things have turned out? Uh, I wouldn't say entirely surprised. I was hopeful. When the Prime Minister won the leadership contest, uh, and he won it very decisively, I believe in democracy. I got behind him, that's what you do. It's the right thing to do. Uh, and he ran an absolutely excellent election campaign. He talked big game on Brexit. We got a Brexit deal through. Of course, there are bits to work out now, but actually, I think the Prime Minister <laughs> initially... You can laugh, Alistair. We know you're not a fan of Brexit. Certainly not. Um, initially started out well, but unfortunately it started unravelling, and it started unravelling because of a lack of integrity and because of lies that were coming out of Downing Street. So Boris Johnson is a liar, that's what you're saying? I think there have been mistruths that have been told, and I think they've continued to be mistold, and whenever they've been caught out, a new lie has been found. Alistair? I mean, anybody who's ever known Boris Johnson, I've known him for over 30 years, anybody who's ever worked with him knows that he's a liar. Every single person who worked with him knew that he was a liar. Every single person who sat around that cabinet table and propped him up knew that he was a liar. Every single right-wing commentator who licked his backside and told us he was going to be a wonderful man, they all knew he was a liar. And the thing is, you say what should happen next. The first thing should happen, he should be got out of Downing Street. John Major is absolutely right. He will do more havoc if he's there as a caretaker. He's corrupt. He's entitled, he's a liar, he's delivered nothing, he's the worst Prime Minister this country has ever had, and the sooner he's out of that place, the better. Okay. The, man in the, the man in the blue shirt. So, always competent enough, then, to get us out of this absolute toxic crisis that we're in that's affecting nation. All right, so who should the next leader be? Well, listen, part that for a minute. We're going to answer this original question, and we will come back to that. Tim with no real functioning government. That's a crucial part of Adam's question, what happens next? Things can only get better. 
Uh, <laughs> I think a spell. It's all a joke to these guys. It's all a joke to these guys. Oh, here we go. Things can only get better. Here we go. They are part of the problem. The British media are part of the problem. They delivered him. They sucked up to him. Oh, he, Johnson has described the Telegraph as his real boss, and they yeah. are part of the problem. The next thing that should happen, our political culture and our media culture have to change, otherwise it will happen again. <laughs> You lied this country into a war that cost thousands of lives. <laughs> well, let, 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 let. Okay. Let Johnson let him... ate some cake. I'll let I really him, don't I'll let think... Alison, Alice, you've got to yeah. let him answer, no. and then I... No, Alison, okay. I'm Fine. in charge here, and then okay. I'll let him come back to you. OK, well, he better be careful what he says, cos the last guy okay. regretted it. Alistair, Carry on. Alistair, you have to let other people speak I will. on the panel. <laughs> Tim. Thank you. I don't think Boris Johnson was particularly more corrupt or untruthful than any politician who's come before. I don't think his time was any, uh, oh, any particular more ridden with... Uh, OK. Any more ridden with scandal. I think the problem was the way he handled it, the complete chaotic nature of his personality and his organisation, um, and, and what that climaxed in, which is what really brought him down, uh, was initially lying about the Chris Pincher affair and then crucially sending ministers out to repeat that falsehood. And ultimately, in our system, you can't govern unless you command a majority, and that majority disappeared. Now, of course, from his point of view, what he would say, and I'm not saying this because I wish to, uh, I, I wish to clean his record or, or even necessarily defend him, but because someone on this program has got to explain why he did what he did in the last 48 hours. Do you think he should have stayed, Tim? Uh, I'm just, no, as I said, I'm not saying he should have done. What I'm saying is someone's got to explain why he's done what he's done. His view was that parliamentary majority you spoke about was his, not the Tory party's. He was elected to do something to deliver Brexit. He felt he was trying to do it, and he thought he was up against a party which had never accepted him. And constitutionally, he had a right to see if he could try to form a government. Ultimately, he failed, and that's when he decided to go. What I thought was very interesting about his resignation speech, when Theresa May resigned, I found it quite an emotional moment. She famously said, I did my best, and you really felt like she had. In his case, it wasn't a resignation speech, it was a surrender. He was saying, I didn't want to go. I don't believe I've done wrong, but you people have forced me out. A very different kind of leadership, presidential rather than, parliament, rather than parliamentary, but I don't think we'll ever see a man of his charisma in that office ever again. Jeez. OK, there are lots of hands up, so let's hear, let's hear from as many people as I can get around. The woman in the striker t-shirt. Um, first of all, how can we trivialise but that what he did wrong by saying that he just ate a piece of cake. That's not what he did. People couldn't bury their family. People couldn't be there when their families were dying because he was eating cake and drinking wine. Because it's a game. So, but, but also, do you not think that this now needs to trigger a general election? Do we not need to decide Absolutely. that... Absolutely. Who's <laughs> yes. In there, in the blue and blue striped top, yes. I just want to say as well what you said about all he did was eat cake. Like, that's not true for many people who I know who watched friends and family in hospital and weren't allowed to say goodbye to them. A very close friend of mine, her grandma died in hospital and she wasn't allowed to go and visit her. How can you trivialise that and say that all he did was eat cake? He completely wrecked the reputation of the Tory party in my eyes because it was one rule for them and another for everyone else. Mm. So I just think that that's completely <laughs> not what if you're asking that as a Conservative or a Labour voter, Adam? Uh, uh, myself, a uh, Labour voter. Right, OK. The man at the back, yes, with the white shirt, short sleeve white shirt. Yes, uh, going back onto your point around the understanding of Boris Johnson being charismatic, there's always been a trend line of charismatic leaders always leading a government into disarray. Their, char their charisma will always allow a lot of people to be disillusioned with what's actually going on, what's actually affecting people. And I think that's what's happened with Boris Johnson. He has sought to stroke his own ego. He has been shameless in what he's done. And it has led the country into ill repute globally. And now we're in this mess. OK. And the man there in the glasses with the beard. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, my opinion of Boris Johnson hasn't really changed. I see him as being despicable, toxic, manipulative, a liar and having the morals of a polecat. My fear... <laughs> my fear is that we are now having a, a leadership election amongst the Tories. I think we will end up with a different jockey riding the same old dead horse. Mm -hmm. 
And I also believe they won't have the courage to go to the country in the near future. OK, well, I'm, I'm going to get to that point. I know there are Conservative voters in this audience. D do any of you feel, I'm not suggesting you should, but do any of you feel you want to speak up for Boris Johnson? Yeah, I agree with that, Mum, there. Right, let's hear from you. Is that any different than sitting and having a Chinese takeaway or a takeaway, which is what Starmer did? Well... And sat there and had drinks, but then denied it? Not the it doesn't matter whether he is or whether he isn't. He sat there and he denied it, and his sidekick even forgot she were there. Well, and of course, the it's police. To me, do you want to the, the, the police have not come to their decision yet, as far as Durham well, is concerned. Hasn't he put? Um... Well, tell you what. Let's. Yes. Okay. I'll do it very quickly. Actually, no. Well, let's... Bridget, you should answer that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm confident Keir Starmer broke no rules, uh, and that will be the conclusion. But we do know beyond doubt that Boris Johnson broke the law, repeatedly lied to the British people. They were wheeling in suitcases full of booze while people were making the most extraordinary sacrifices. But this is about more than just one man and one man's actions. This is about the Conservative Party. The last 12 years, not just the last 12 months, <laughs> We're in a position now where you can't get a GP appointment, where you wait months on end in pain uh, to get seen at the hospital, where our children who went through the most terrible experience during the pandemic still don't have the support that they need in order to catch up on all of that lost learning and development time. And to go back to the original question, no, we don't have a functioning government and we don't have a government focused on the issues that are really important right now. The cost of living, the cost of childcare, the fact that when people do the weekly shop, they have to put things back. That we're a country now in modern Britain where people at food banks turn down food that they have to cook because they don't have the means to cook it. And, and, and I the think other that should be a question. source of shame for us all. And that comes down to the last 12 years, not just Boris Johnson, a Conservative Party that enabled and facilitated this man, rotten from top to bottom. The other half of the question, Bridget, is what should happen next? One of the people in the audience here mentioned a general election, and Keir Starmer has, has said that's what he thinks should happen. I'd relish the opportunity to set out the difference that a Labour government would make to this country. We so face... talk, us, talk us through this, this suggestion of, of holding a vote of no confidence. What is the significance of that, and when are you going to do it? So it falls to the Conservative Party, first and foremost, to get Boris Johnson out of Downing Street now. He should have already gone. He should not still be squatting in Downing Street. If he doesn't go, we'll force a vote of no confidence and he'll be out. <laughs> Obviously, if the, if the Conservatives don't back that, you won't win that vote of confidence. Well, so it, it, it might again, end up an well, empty gesture. Well, again, it's on them. It's, it. Again, it is on them. They okay. have a choice to make. And this is not just about him. This is about every Conservative MP, every member of that Cabinet, who still, despite everything that they know about him, about the fact that he enabled a sexual predator to be at the heart of government, they went out and defended that. I find it sickening that we allow someone like that <clears> to be at the heart of government. Okay. Winston, Adam's original question is, with no real functioning government currently, and we've still got something like 30 ministerial posts unfilled, what happens next? I'd like to pick up on Bridget's point there, uh, that uh, it turns out there are more sex pests in the Tory party than there are in the music business, which really is saying something. <laughs> I'd also like to pick up on the two things these two ladies said about uh, the cake. This is a, a Prime Minister, the, the only ever sitting Prime Minister to have a criminal charge. And we've talked about... Uh, how uh, he's a liar and, and all these other things. But what about his incompetence? This guy, inflation has gone, is now at 9.1%, projected to get to 11%. Uh, pretty much the entire public sector is striking or are preparing to strike. There's labour shortages in, in agriculture and in, in, in uh, air uh, travel as well, uh, as well as other industries. And this is, this is the government, and I haven't even talked about the NHS and all that, but this is the government that purports to be the safe hands for the economy. Right? This is it's total incompetency, and that alone is a uh, reason that he should have gone a long time ago. Mm. OK. The man in the... I can't see what's on your show. Is it...? Foxes. Foxes? <laughs> yeah. Right, OK. Um, well, what is the point in replacing Boris Johnson when the people that are going to lead the Conservative Party are just as corrupt as he is? Mm. He's just got more of charisma than they would have. The only reason that I feel that he's been ousted is because he's shining a light upon the corruption in the Conservative Party as a whole. Yeah. Well, but, one of the questions I think came from you is who should be the next leader? So, I mean, I there. Want to are... deal with Iraq. Okay, I'll let you do that in a moment. Uh, now, let, let me just go around, and then when I come fine. to you, you can put that in there. So, in terms of who should be the next leader, Deanna, who's going to get your vote? It's got to be someone with a proper vision. 
that's going to carry this country forward, that's going to frankly make Great Britain a great place that the world really kind of relish and look up to. I thought we Johnson need was that. Going to do that. Do you ever let anyone finish an okay, answer? Okay, carry on. Nice. On you go. Who's going to have a proper vision, but is going to inspire this country to want to do better and to move forward. And for me, a person with that vision, with a good economic vision, but also with a track record of delivery in government, is Liz Truss. So if she stands, she'll be getting my support. Oh, my God. OK. <laughs> so you're applauding that, so let's hear from you. Uh, I agree uh, that Liz Truss uh, should be the next Prime Minister. Uh, and why do you think her? Because uh, there's big decisions to be made. Uh, at this moment in time, Boris Johnson is uh, going to try and be a caretaker up until October. How can it take so long to re-elect uh, a Prime Minister when we can have next week uh, a 22 committee getting a vote of no confidence uh, in just a week's time? And what do you think of John Major's letter today where he's effectively describing uh, Boris Johnson as a kind of human wrecking ball uh, in, in Westminster and that you just can't be left there? and someone else needs to stand in as a caretaker. You think that should happen? I think he's concentrated uh, too much on the other issues rather than the main political uh, party issues, which are uh, obviously what he was democratically elected for. Uh, and okay. I think he has, to, to be fair, had a lot of those to, to put up with rather than most prime ministers in the past. I'm not defending him in that respect, but he has had to put up with a lot. Well, I should point out Liz Truss, of course, has not yet said she was standing. Just as you were pulling that, there were a lot of groans. Who was groaning there? To who, who was that? You were, right. Let's hear from you. Well, as you say, the journalist there, sorry, I forgot your name. Um, this is Tim. Tim, that things can only get better. How can things get better under a Tory government? <laughs> the, the cost of living crisis, you've got children going to school, who are hungry, asking teachers for food. You've got homelessness. People can't afford, you know, to heat their homes. It's either eat or heat. The, the whole political system needs to change. Mm. We need to put people before profit. And that is all the Tories think about, is That's looking after the rich friends and they don't do anything for okay. working people. OK, let's hear from the man behind you in the stripy shirt. Thank you. Slightly different point. Um, I agree we should have a, a general election, but I don't think that's going to happen. Whatever happens, I just wish the government would stop, start governing and stop just doing 24-7 campaigning and covering big dogs behind. Okay. And the man in the black shirt. Why haven't we got a credible opposition? This is what the country needs. We need a, someone to put up against the Conservatives and put points across and get change. They're not credible at the moment. That's why the Conservatives can do what they want. All right, Alison, you want to come back in? Well, I'm, I'm, I, will, I will come back in that. Um, I, I, first of all, I insist on dealing with the point about Iraq because these guys, this is what they do, they throw out stuff. We've had six inquiries into Iraq, cleared by them all. The guy who started that whole thing was a guy called Andrew Gilligan, who was a colleague of Tim's at The Telegraph. And do you know what his job is now? He's transport advisor to Boris Johnson. They're all in it together. They're part of the same corrupt class. I'll come on to your question now, if, mm -hmm. unless Bridget wants to answer it. I, I agree that I think Labour are not strong enough. I'm a, I was expelled from the Labour Party for voting Lib Dem in protest at their Brexit stance, but I'm still absolutely 100% Labour to the core. But I want Labour to do better, and I think they can do better, but they must do better. <sighs> Everywhere I go around this country, and be, long before Pinchergate, whatever we want to call it, for some time now, people have loathed this government. They feel a sense of disgust about what this government is doing to the country. But they're not yet looking across the aisle and thinking that's the alternative. And that is not the public's fault. That is that the Labour Party has got to campaign harder, develop policy harder, understand that to win power in this country against entrenched Conservative interests is really, really hard. And I want them to do better, do harder, because I tell you, if these Tories get back another term, I honestly fear for the future of this country. I really do. What's your response to that, Peter? I, mean, I want us to do better. We'll continue to do better. I mean, just but why do you think you aren't? Do, why, to answer yeah. Alice's point, why do you think you I aren't? I think taking a better? step back, thinking back to where we were in 2019 and the election and the result that we suffered then, we had such a big mountain to climb 
and it was always going to take time. But I think the progress that we've been making, as shown in the local elections and the by-election in Wakefield, shows that we are making progress. But I completely acknowledge that we've got a lot more to do to win over the trust of people again, because it was such a big breach in 2019. We, you know, <laughs> Once you've lost people's trust and confidence, it takes time to build it back. But in terms of one area where, we, where we'd be taking action right now to make life better for families, to make change across our country, on climate change, a big challenge that we face both here and across the world, but also a real opportunity to provide well-paid, highly skilled jobs that provide for the next generation. Because we've seen terrible economic growth over the last 12 years in this country, and that means we've taken a real hit on living standards that people's wages haven't kept up. There's a lot more that we will say come the general election, but I'm determined that we will set out that really positive vision about the change that we need to see, because I think Britain is currently stuck. We are stuck in this mire, and I think people are crying out for, for real change, for fresh leadership. And I think the contrast between the leadership that Keir Starmer has offered and is offering up against Boris Johnson and any of the other names that we'll hear about in the weeks um, ahead, I think the contrast is very, very stark. A credible, serious person who will put our country first. We're a brilliant country. I love our country. But I tell you, we haven't had a government that gives our country what it needs for a very long time. Tim, you wanted to come in. Yes, I, I'm certainly not part of any political class, um, if I have any class at all. And in fact, the only time I've ever run for Parliament was for your party, was for the Labour Party, although you're not in it anymore, are you? Um, I would point out that much of the distrust that's there in modern politics began with new Labour. It began with the culture of spin. It began with the sense that you couldn't trust what politicians were saying. And it also began, it also... We will hear you no Come well. It also, it also, New Labour also launched the role of celebrity in our culture as well, um, rather than substance and principle and, and philosophy. Um, and as regards to what can change, well, the, the, the gentleman said they're all corrupt, they're all tainted. There are people who will be running in this election campaign who have never worked for Boris Johnson, who are coming from outside of the cabinet. And although I suspect uh, that I'll do him more harm than good, I personally would be supporting Tom Tugendhat for leader of the Conservative Party, precisely because he is a man who has served his country in the military. He comes from the outside. He's an expert in foreign affairs. And I think he would provide a, a completely new start when it comes to the Conservatives. I hope if he does do that, by the way, that one thing he does is go back to being a bit more conservative on economic policy, because all these issues around cost of living, there is a traditional Tory answer to that. And it's lower taxes and a smaller government. Winston. I think this gentleman's uh, calling out uh, Labour uh, is right to. Uh, down the road from here, Wakefield, we had a by-election last month because uh, there's a Tory MP, Imran Ahmad Khan, who was ousted as a paedophile. And the by-election, if you look at the... There was a polling done on why the soft voters voted for Labour. It was a, it was, it was a Conservative seat. It went back to Labour. It was Labour, then back to Conservative, then back to Labour. And the reason, none of the reasons were for Labour. It was against the Conservatives. The Conservatives don't understand the working class. The Conservative, uh, Boris Johnson do, doesn't respect the truth. And it was the first 20 reasons why they voted was against the Conservatives, not for Labour. And Labour have a real, pro real problem there. What does Keir Starmer really represent? He, he voted 48 times against uh, Brexit. So whether he believes in democracy is kind of hard to, to sort of get behind, uh, even though this week I know he said he's finally, six years later, going to get fully behind uh, Brexit. He, uh, uh, um, he, he didn't support the strikers. I mean, if the leader of the Labour Party doesn't support the strikers, what does he represent? Uh, he dabbles in wokery. It's time he sets aside to get a, a Labour leader who really believes in Labour, true Labour values, get a Lisa Nandy or an Andy Burnham, someone to come in and... and take over Labour. We're going to continue I, this conversation. Yeah. Alison, respectfully, there are so many things to call out Boris Johnson on. So many things. And to call out him on, on his lying, and you said he was lying and lying and lying. And I was just a, a, a boy, a teenager in, in 2003. But I, the politics I was brought up with was your politics, with new Labour politics. And, and I remember the dodgy dossier. And, and sorry, the, the, the idea to call out Boris Johnson on lying is, is the pot calling the kettle black. I'm, I'm, well, I know you can say it. No, you can say it. Look, I have, I, have, I have some respect for you. Certainly more than, than Tim, but let me just deal with the let me just deal with the with the substance of it. What would you do than have literally six 
inquiries, including two very rigorous public inquiries, all of which showed and established that there were no lies. There was a policy decision made which a lot of people disagreed with. They still disagreed with it, but there was no conspiracy, there was no lie. There was a policy decision that the Prime Minister had to take. So I do respect you. I think the point about spin is nonsense. I think that the Labour government delivered an awful lot for this country. I think one of, one of the reasons I get so angry about Brexit is because I think one of the greatest things we did, the Good Friday Agreement, is being undermined and potentially destroyed by what they're doing. I think that Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, we had a substantial figures who really were in politics because of what they believed. I'd say the same about Thatcher. I'd say the same about Major. My calling out of Boris Johnson is to do with the fact He's a populist, he's a polarizer, he's our first post-truth prime minister. He is Trumpian in virtually everything he does, including st staying in Downing Street beyond his welcome. So I take your point, but I respectfully say I think you're wrong. I think Boris Johnson is the worst prime minister and the biggest liar we've ever had in public office. Okay, I'll come back to you in just a second. The things we've been touching here, here on here in terms of Labour and Brexit, we are going to come on to, but before we do, I just want to tell you, uh, next week, the programme will be coming from Torquay. Uh, and after that, we're going to have a break for the summer. But if you would like to be part of our Torquay programme, you can go to the website, follow the instructions there, and you can come and be part of our audience. And then, of course, the Conservative leadership race gets going. So who knows? We might be back on air for that. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, next week, it's Torquay. All right, let's take another question, which is from Dick Lindley. Where? Ah, there we are. Has Boris actually won the... Uh, question of Brexit <laughs> now that the Labour Party has completely changed its mind. Right, so this week, uh, for those you may not be familiar with, there's an awful lot's happened this week. It's hard to believe it's just been a week. But Keir Starmer pledged to make Brexit work. He ruled out rejoining the single market. This is what you're referring to, Dick, isn't it? Uh, or the customs union, and he ruled out restoring freedom of movement. So in that case, has Boris won the Brexit question, Bridget? Well, he won it when he won the general election in 2019. That's the reality. And as a result of that, we left the European Union. So that happened. And for me, it's about looking to the future and the changes that we need to make. And that comes, takes us to the Northern Ireland Protocol, for example, where you know, there are things that need to change. Um, I want to see us exporting more. I, I do want to see changes to the deal that's been negotiated. But it's about looking to the future, I think, rather than looking back. And, I, and there's I, not unanimity within the Labour Party about this, though, is there? We had Sadiq Khan, the London Mayor, had Stella Creasy, who were not agreeing with what Keir Starmer said this Well, week. of course, people will always want to have a discussion about this. Of course they do. But I do just want to return to this issue of the record of the last Labour government, because like Winston, I grew up under that government in Sunderland. And I saw the difference that it made and the transformation and the change it made in my life, the transformation in my community. You know, child poverty, massively cut. We invested in our schools. We supported people back into work. We saw tremendous change. People weren't waiting months on end in order to wait for, you know, hip replacements. We inherited a terrible situation in 1997. And I saw it in my own family. People left in agony. And we fixed all of that. So whatever criticism people can offer, and no government is perfect, okay, no government but, will ever be perfect. But we're but in the here and now. Absolutely, but we still we face many of these okay, challenges. Okay, but the question is, today, has Boris won the Brexit on. question? You say, well, obviously parties will always have disagreements or discussions. But do you think his time will be able to take the party with him? On his, on his decision on Brexit, given that we've already heard two fairly prominent voices disagreeing. Yes, absolutely, because we're focused on how we make this work. We, you know, when the general election result was so devastating for Labour, it was a clear result, and we need to look to the future and not look back, on, and focusing on how we make it uh, work for the country. Dick, you've got your hand up. What's yeah, your point? Yeah, it's a mockery of the Labour Party, though. I heard Keith Starmer speaking passionately about rejoining the common market, as he called it, and yet, Boris managed to uh, work our escape from the uh, EU. And although he's a naughty boy, and everybody knows that, and maybe he wants his legs slapping, I don't know, but he is a naughty boy. Well, he's but a bit the, more the than greatest, that now, hasn't he? But the greatest thing that Boris Johnson did for this country was allowing us to escape from the clutches of the European community. Look. And for that, I will be forever grateful <laughs> for I spoke passionately in, in, in terms of wanting to stay in the European Union in 2016. I did. I make no apology for that. I will always do what I think is right by my country. But I lost that argument. I did. And then we lost the general election. So for me, it's about looking to the future. Okay. 
Tim. That, that probably is uh, Boris's greatest victory and his legacy. And, and it's always the way, isn't it? It's the same with Thatcher producing new Labour, that you can measure how successful a government is by whether or not the opposition goes on to ape it. I would say that Keir Starmer has no choice, that he literally can't build a majority unless he's able to appeal to those red wall seats and win them back. And he knows that Brexit is his best path for doing that. I do, by the way, feel, uh, feel some... Um, some sympathy for Remainers, partly because they are a large constituency, because their warnings uh, are bearing fruit. I think there are plus sides to Brexit, but there are negative, and we're seeing some of them. There's no disputing that. And what warnings are you thinking of in particular? Well, their warnings around Northern Ireland, their warnings around the movement of trade. These are perfectly reasonable objections. I believe, as a Brexiteer, that they can be. Uh, that they, there are ways of making up for them through your tax and other policies. But what I'm saying is, I can understand why they would feel annoyed that at the very moment to which it seems that the project is, is hitting some rocks, that's the moment at which Labour walks away. Um, and also there's an argument for saying there is a third way, which is something like the Norway option where you apply for membership of the Customs Union, etc. So there is, a, there is space for a Lib Dem style third way policy on Europe. But ultimately, they had to change. I, I do think we're now going to move, particularly the next leader, I suspect, of the Tory party will be a moderate. I think we're going to move much, back, much more closer to the centre and to a period of consensus. And when we look back on this time in which we're given the option of Boris Johnson versus Jeremy Corbyn, and you can see it as a time of great, of great chaos, which, of course, it has been, but it's also been one of real choice, real choosing. And Jeremy Corbyn, for all his faults, stood very clearly for a variety of internationalist democratic socialism uh, that many disaffected voters were drawn to, in the same way that Boris Johnson clearly spoke for a variety of patriotic Brexit politics that many working class voters were drawn towards. And I, I'm, I'm interested to know, where will those constituencies go? It feels like in the last few years, we've tried to pour new wine into old wineskins, and the parties have essentially rejected the wine. Boris Johnson lost his job. Jeremy Corbyn is literally expelled from the Labour Party. Diana, what do you make of what Tim had to say about the next leader of the Conservative Party and, and perhaps looking for a more moderate kind of third way through the sort of Brexit situation that we're in now? Liz Truss, I'm not sh sure she would necessarily fall into that category, would she? Well, I think, I think you know, for, for Liz, and I'm not here on some part of some like Liz leadership sure. campaign at all, but I, I, I well, think... maybe you won't, we don't know. know. I'm, I'm not, I'd be honest if I was. Um, I think... She's really forthright and she's really trying to find a way forward that works for Britain. Because at the end of the day, we had this incredible opportunity in 2016 to make a decision about what we wanted our future to look like. I was a Brexiteer. I was a very proud Brexiteer. And in the end, that is what the British people voted for, for self-determination, for us to be able to move forward, take control of our own borders, make our own decisions about what our future looks like. And I think that is such an exciting prospect and opportunity. And, and are you happy to, with the way it's turning well, out? Well, we really need to be able to embrace all of the opportunities that, that that brings. And unfortunately, for the people of Northern Ireland, that just isn't the case at the moment. So I think taking a forthright approach with Europe, really standing up to them, because they certainly don't always operate on a level playing field when it comes to these negotiations. Standing up to them, making sure that we get the brightest future possible. Now, COVID, the war Is this in Ukraine. Is the already deal? I'll finish my answer first, thanks, Alison. Mm. COVID and the war in Ukraine cre clearly have created some huge challenges that we need to overcome. And unfortunately, I think for some of those people that have always been anti-Brexit, they are conflating some of the issues to say, oh, Brexit's an absolute disaster. Of course, it's not working. But actually, I'm incredibly optimistic because we have the opportunity to strike new trade deals, forge new trading relationships with countries all over the world. And I have a very optimistic vision to know that Brexit is going to work and is going to deliver the prosperity that our country deserves. Okay. In the glasses. So I voted for Brexit, unfortunately. Um, oh, so hang on, hang on. Let's <laughs> examine that a minute. So is that buyer's remorse we're hearing there? It is, yeah. And why do you feel like that? What has it delivered for people on the ground? Ordinary people like me, what has it delivered? It's going to cost me seven quid to get to Europe. Um, taxes have gone up. Sorry, it's going to cost you seven quid to get It's going to cost you a bit more. Well, they're on about introducing charges for uh, immigration now in Europe. So that's going to add on to cost of living, so to speak. Um, taxes have gone up. The slogan on the side of a bus was a complete lie because mm. taxes have gone up. So that's not reality. Northern Ireland's in trouble because, as Alistair said, the Good Friday Agreement. For young people, I think it's a complete, you know, it's a mistake. Mm. So, 
Deanna, it's always well you being optimistic, but his reality is, is that it's not working. Well, I need to bounce back on the, the slogan on the side of the bus, because actually this government's yeah. delivered far more than £350 million a week for the NHS. Where is far, it? far where, more. Where, where is it for ordinary people? For ordinary people, it's, it's going in, and you will appreciate that the Covid pandemic presented such enormous... You've just had to put taxes to their highest in 70 years to pay for the National Health Service. He loves talking over people well, this time. Well, you talk nonsense. Okay, if okay. you're going to talk Alison, nonsense, I'm going to correct you. Alison, I'm going to come to you, but let her answer. OK, panel. but don't talk nonsense. If you're going to talk nonsense... Alison, I'm will. thrilled you're on the panel and okay, really want to hear what you. you've got to say, but we have to let other people right, speak okay. as well. Isn't, this isn't man it? has made a point. We want to hear what the audience yeah. say. You, are, sir, are disappointed with the way Brexit's turning out. You're hugely optimistic. How optimistic. do you answer him? Because we haven't fully had the opportunity to embrace some of the benefits of Brexit yet. Because the pandemic, because the war in Ukraine, I'm incredibly optimistic. We need to get the last bits of the detail knuckled down. Liz Truss is working on this hard at the moment, as are other Foreign Office ministers. She is getting confident. a lot of mentions, isn't she, now, Liz Well, she is the Foreign Secretary. OK, no, OK, She's, fair enough. This is literally within her brief. Um, working incredibly hard on this, as are lots of very dedicated civil servants who are very much on top of the detail. I'm very confident, very optimistic, but it's going to take more than just Brexit. It's the opportunities that that brings, the opportunity to set our own tax rates. OK, so how long, how long do you think... Sorry, what's your name? Lewis. Lewis, how long do you think Lewis will have to wait before he thinks he made the right decision? Well, I'm hoping not very long at all, because I'm hoping... Well, like a year, with, two years, I'm hoping years. with a new leader, whoever that may be, we do start to embrace the low-tax, proper, conservative economic regime that will bring some of those benefits, that see cheaper prices in shops, better employment opportunities, great opportunities for people in this part of the world, in Bishop Auckland, the area that I'm very proud to represent, who do need levelling up, who do need those opportunities, okay. and I am confident let's, it's let's, Lewis, are you convinced? Not really. You mentioned COVID. National insurance has just gone up to account for the £12 billion that got lost in fraud. Mm -hmm. And then Ukraine is a so recent event it's, it's that you can't really amalgamate in... the two together. Well, okay. the, the national right. insurance rise is not something that I voted for. OK, the man with the glasses there in the blue T-shirt, I think yeah. you're wearing. Um, something which is really interesting is, so we voted to leave the European Union and the role of the government is to secure the best opportunities for the country then why didn't we say yes to the European ventilator scheme? Because actually we, we were offered loads of ventilators by Europe and we said no through arrogance, so why? Yeah, I mean, we went on to develop our own ventilators, but you're right, we did opt out of that scheme. The man there in the blue T-shirt and the green jacket with the glasses. Yeah, so, uh, big fan of the podcast, Alistair. Thank However, you, sir. However, um, <laughs> one thing that you do, and I find that Remainers do do, um, now, I was on the fence and voted leave in the voting booth, but when this country comes together and decides they're going to do something, if we took the view that it's a zero sum, Brexit's happened, mm. let's work on what's the best thing forward now for the country. And what <laughs> Remainers do is argue, Brexit's bad, they promise you this, this didn't happen. Mm. Maybe so, but we're, we're never going to go back in. So we need to stop talking about that and we need to move on and make well, it let me, better. Well, let me, let me you, thank you very much for listening to the podcast and enjoying it, uh, where we agree disagree agreeably. Um, but let me just say why I still feel this is worth talking about. I think Keir Starmer's real strength is, as, as, uh, as Bridget said earlier, his integrity, his honesty, the fact that you can see him as a Prime Minister. I think that when you have a situation where we know, at a time of a cost of living crisis, there is a 4% hit on GDP, and we know why. There is a 4% hit on productivity, and we know why. When you see the reality of what's happening in North Ireland, the reality of what's happening in, at, at, at ports, the reality of going to airports and finding that you're, you're in the lane and you can't get through quick and all the rest of it, and the nightmare for farmers and fishermen and all the promises that were broken. What I liked about Keir's speech uh, this week is actually I think Labour have to keep calling that out because that has to be part of a debate. Where I completely disagreed with Keir this week was in saying that there can be no discussion at all of going back into the customs union, for example. When that wasn't, when every single Brexiteer, Boris Johnson, probably you, everybody else, said that was not even on the agenda. So the Brexit we've got is so far removed from the Brexit that was promised. It's doing massive damage to the economy. It's doing massive damage to our standing in the world. And I just think that is a debate we have to keep alive. I'm not saying we're going back in. I'm not saying Labour should fight on that. But we cannot have this gigantic elephant in the room and pretend that it doesn't exist. So yeah. well, just say that again, because the microphone wasn't over you. Uh, sorry, I was saying we, we need to stop the toxic debate. Brexit's <coughs> happened. And you just keep saying, 
yes, no, Northern Ireland. I might agree with you. Yeah, but we've got to if you spent your energy coming up with solutions we've got to, to fix it. solve it, we've tried. It. Okay. We've tried let's hear. Let's hear from these two yeah. women here. We've yes, tried. The woman in the glass. They don't want Thank it. you very much. Um, coming back to Brexit and who was going to be the next Prime Minister and what happens next. You talk about a mandate for the Conservative Party and Boris Johnson delivered Brexit, but he delivered a promise that was nowhere near what people thought they were voting for. So to say that you've got a majority. It was based on something that was never going to happen. So you can't say that that's your mandate to go forward now and just plough on with Brexit. We trust the Conservative Party... So you think there should be a general election, do you? I'm, I'll get to that point. We trust the Conservative Party to be the economic leaders, to be the people that can steer you and low taxes and promoting business. But I think you've lost sight of representative democracy and what the actual people need. I think it doesn't matter which member of the Conservative Party becomes the next Prime Minister because you've all had the chance to deliver your promises on Brexit, to look at the cost of living crisis, to look at all the masses of money that were wasted on like PPE and the damage that's done to the environment. So yes, we do need a general election, but it needs to be a general election where people are given the right information and there's no lies and false advertising and false promises because we're just going to end up with another 12 years of this. All right. And the woman next to you wants to say something. Yes, so I just wanted to agree with the last gentleman. I think as a country, we do need to move on from this uh, Brexit question. I voted Remain, but I know, you know, you have to respect democracy. You have to respect what people voted for. So I think whoever is going to be the new leader needs to bring people together, because as a country, we are very divided at the moment. But yes, we have to move on with Brexit. Winston, do you want to come in here? So the original question, we've, we've ranged around a whole sort of all round it, really, but has Boris won the Brexit question now that Labour has changed its mind? Well, I didn't vote for Brexit. I actually sport my ballot because I couldn't decide at the time. But I believe strongly, absolutely, that the will of the people must be fulfilled. And on a personal uh, level, that means I... I'm going to do everything I can to make it a success. I don't believe in, in, in going backwards. Now, talking about uh, the music industry, and so I, I, I could talk a little bit about how, how Brexit has affected the music industry. The music industry was almost completely against Brexit, but there were a couple of voices who were for it. Uh, uh, you might remember Roger Daltrey of The Who saying, uh, we, we were touring uh, Europe before we were part of a political union. We'll be touring it again after we've, after we've left. And it's turned out to be true. Bands now are touring again. There's still more that needs to be finalised. I, I think we haven't got a deal yet with Portugal, but on whole... So there's all that, that paperwork issue. That seemed to be the problem. That's, that's pretty much gone now. There's paperwork issue, and it has affected the industry. So... Uh, Particularly merchandise, I think bands will probably, uh, the reports I've seen suggest that there's maybe 25% less profit, maybe more, uh, and it affects, some businesses have been cut in, in two, so they're now, like, trucking and transport and production comp companies will have a European base as well as a, a British base, which means less revenue for the British um, uh, coffers, but, uh, so that plays to what the, the, the gentleman was saying at the back, in the short term, yeah, there, there are, it's been negative for the industry in that, in, in that sense, from an economic point of view. But it's going to take time, and, um, and my opinion is we've got to give it time. It might take a decade, it might take longer, but it's up to us to make it a success, I think, as a people, not just the, the government. Let me take a couple more points, and I'm going to move on. The woman in the red dress with the glasses. I also voted Remain, but I am accepting of the result and understand we need to move forward to try and make the best of it. Dehenna, you represent a constituency where most of my family actually live in Bishop oh, nice. Auckland. Um, you keep talking about being optimistic. What are you optimistic that's going to happen to help close the North-South divide and give opportunities for people that where it may not necessarily have been the case? This, this now, I'm going, I'm, we actually, I think we might be coming on to that in just one okay. second. So do you mind holding that thought just a second? And the man here in the white chair. My base is we're going to follow on from that. We've heard about the rich Tories. There's a hell of a lot of Labour MPs who are multimillionaires. The old Labour, if they'd heard about a crisis like we've got at the moment, they'd be demanding that school children got free meals throughout it. And anything else they can do to help the, the parents who's working, the taxi drivers, the lorry drivers, things that's keeping the country running, let them have a relaxation on the fees that they pay for 12 months. We had an MOT gap, but how many businesses are going to go under? So you want Labour to be doing more? Yeah, Bridget, definitely. Bridget, do you want to answer that quickly? 
Yeah, so we wouldn't have cut universal credit. We think that was completely the wrong thing for the government to do, not least going into a cost of living crisis. But so why, why did you vote against the comes, change in the taper Where it comes to children, and it, it, they won't, that doesn't, it's not going to solve it. It's, I'm afraid it's it just isn't going to solve it. It's a thousand pounds in the pockets of the, so it, the lowest... Look, Working well families are your... significantly... You voted against Hang on, hang on, hey. don't talk over each other. Working families oh, are significantly... Stop it, stop it. Working ah, families... Ah. Sorry. I cannot believe that coming from you. <laughs> Working families are significantly worse off under your government. There is... All of the evidence is absolutely clear about that. Uh, the gentleman mentioned free school meals. I think you supported free school meals throughout, did you, or not? Have yeah, I got we that encourage the government to take action on that. We think it's absolutely necessary. But where it comes to what needs to happen, so we set out a children's recovery plan. The government had an expert to look at the impact of the pandemic on children and families. Uh, the expert resigned in protest because the government failed to act. What we've said is that we should have breakfast clubs and after school activities for all of our children. They've missed out on so much during the pandemic. Small group tutoring for all of our children who need it and extra help around childcare for our youngest children too. So there's a lot, there's a lot that we have said. Um, because we know the pressures that families are facing, I completely agree with you. There is tremendous pressure right now, and it's the job of government to act. And that does go to the debate I think we're having around Brexit, which I think you know has been you know genuinely insightful in terms of how we bring people together and look to the future. But so much, um, so many of the issues, are, whether it's the money for the NHS, um, how we fund our public services, the level of taxation. Those are questions that are settled at Westminster, and that's you know in the hands of British governments to decide how they okay. want to proceed. But having a fair tax system that doesn't hammer working people, that doesn't cut universal credit, that doesn't put up national insurance, that doesn't impose 15 tax rises in two years. Okay, okay. Let's now. You mentioned there the, the lady in the red dress. You talked about uh, the north-south divide and getting more money for this area, more benefits for this area. We have a question on that. Maybe it's you. I don't know. Alison Cooper. Ah. There you are. And in another red top. There we go. Thank you. Why isn't Barnsley considered priority one for levelling up funding? Ooh. Right. So for those of you who are not aware... Uh, so the levelling up funding, there was the, the priority one took place. There were 123 uh, cities or towns that were considered priority one to get levelling up funding. Barnsley was not one of them. Uh, and we're still waiting to see when priority... Uh, two will come around uh, and when the next round will come around and whether Barnsley will be in that. We've no idea at the moment. Um, it got £46 million from other funding, but in terms of the levelling up funding specifically, it did not qualify. Alistair. I think the simple answer is because it's a labour area. Uh, why did Rishi Sunak's Richmond get levelling up funding? Yeah, exactly. I've been to Richmond. <laughs> I'd have a very nice holiday there. Yeah. Not sure about Barnsley. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I think it's because you're a Labour area, you've got a Labour mayor, uh, and I think, honestly, I do think that it's, it's, as, it's as, as simple as that. And the other thing to point out, I think I'm right in saying, you've had 40% cuts in your local authority mm -hmm. budgets as well. Mm -hmm. And I think Bridget was absolutely right. We focused so much on Boris Johnson, but what's happening to areas like this, it's not just the fact that levelling up is a slogan without a strategy and a slogan without a policy, it's also that places like this have borne the brunt of 10 years of austerity. That's, you know, and that's why when they do finally get Boris Johnson out of Downing Street and they do elect a, uh, a successor, we can't just keep allowing the choice of our Prime Minister to be dictated by Tory MPs and 111,000 ageing Tory party members. That's what's going to happen. And if that happens, you're just going to get the same again. <laughs> Just on the point Alice you made about Richie Sunak's Richmond constituency, which is wealthier uh, than Barnsley, it was on that priority one list. It didn't actually get the funding, but it was okay. put on I that priority it, list. Sorry, Winston. So the Conservative Party, their mandate, which won them the election, was getting Brexit done and levelling up. Now, as a dirty southerner, uh, I've been much more interested in here what the people of Barnsley think about uh, the uh, levelling up and how it's gone. But... Uh, one thing that has appalled me has been the HS1. Uh, somehow they managed to spunk 100 billion. Do you mean HS2? I'm HS2, sorry. All right. Somebody thought that was another one I hadn't heard of, but right. <laughs> uh, HS2, uh, which 100 billion quid, and all it's done is shorten the, the, the London to Manchester commute by 15 minutes. While, now, that figure might have been slightly more bearable if it had gone like it was supposed to, here to Yorkshire, like it was supposed to, up to the northeast and actually it had been more, more effective, or if they'd spent some money upgrading the, all the travel services uh, in, in this part of the country. But to me, that's been absolutely shocking. 
OK. Before I go around, Alison, do you want to come back in? Yes, please. Um, just in response to Alistair, um, it's a wonderful place to oh, live. Oh, I know that. And the only place I know is no, the football know. ground. And um, we sit um, very centrally to um, lots of infrastructure, motorways. Um, a little bit more money would have really boosted the economy to Barnsley, um, especially the, the, the road structures and the railway structures. You know, an hour to Manchester, um, 20 minutes to Leeds, 20 minutes to Sheffield would have made a massive difference mm. Mm. To, to this town. Mm. Mm. So why wasn't Barnsley priority one for levelling up funding Deanna when someone like Richmond, which is wealthier, was? The, the honest answer is I don't know, and I'm really surprised and shocked by it, actually. Um, I grew up in, in well, this Well, there was part lots of about it in the papers at the time. It can't I, be I, I, grew, I grew up in this part of the world, um, and I just very quickly need to bounce back to a point you made, this point about Richmond versus Barnsley. Well, Doncaster, Rotherham and Sheffield have all received levelling up funding, and I wouldn't say they're necessarily naturally conservative areas. No, no, so, no, but so I'm, I'm I think it's, saying that I think it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek and, and, and a little bit cheeky. What I would say is that there are great funds coming to Barnsley. We've got the Towns Fund, which is going to see some new developments in, um, in Goldthorpe, I believe, which should be really beneficial. Yeah. And it's hopefully the sort of tangible change that we need to see on the ground, because one of the things I get frustrated by that politicians often do is talk about, oh, we're getting X million pounds. I want to know what it's actually going to do. I want to know what that money, that random sum that no one can imagine, is actually going to do for people. I know, but I think it's, it's great that you want to know, but I think Alison wants to know well, this, this when is she's going to get it, what's going to do for her. Well, this is why I'm talking about the Towns Fund, which is one thing that has been delivered. Now, I understand, because I was speaking to some of the guys from Barnsley Council, that further bids are going to be put into the levelling uh -huh. up fund, yeah. and I really do hope that they're successful, because some of the works around the sort of Elska Heritage Centre will be fantastic yes, will. if they go through. But this is... One of these things, the government's commitment to levelling up really is there and really is real. I think there's been a little bit too much emphasis on money. I think we talk about funding a lot. There has to be more than funding. It has to go much more structural than that. Because we always talk what do you about mean, then? as in we always talk about levelling up in terms of how much money an area is getting and in terms of jobs, but levelling up is so much more than that. It's also about healthcare, it's about education outcomes. It's a much bigger package of work. There's some incredible work going on when it comes to education. The skills bill, which is going to make sure that people can get skills for life and retrain, move into, into different fields, new education um, action areas. Again, I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm a very positive person. I sincerely hope that levelling up fund bid is successful. Um, but certainly, this is something we need to do because it isn't... OK. I'm trying. The, the woman in the red dress, because you asked this earlier on, yes. Yes, um, just to go back to what I said, obviously you, you represent um, the constituency where most of my family live. You are talking about optimism, which is, which is great on paper, but what conversations have you had and what do you plan to do for an area that's... So what I've seen is quite deprived, really. Well, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing a lot in Bishop Auckland at the moment. I'm in almost daily meetings, particularly about town fund, levelling up fund and future high streets fund. Three things that are really going to revolutionise Bishop Auckland town centre, the areas surrounding it. That is a really big project that is really going to be fantastic, creating new employment opportunities, new opportunities for young people, so that they don't feel that in order to get on in life, they have to leave the area that they grew up in. Okay. because it's disgraceful and there should be good opportunities everywhere in this country so that no matter where you're born, no matter where you're from, no matter your upbringing, if you've got the drive and you've got the energy and the talent, you okay. can get on. Woman here. Um, just picking up on what Winston said about HS2, I think lots of people who live around here, and, and I'm one of them, um, don't want to get to London 15 minutes quicker. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be able to get to work in Huddersfield <laughs> on a opposite. train that's not going to leave me stranded at the end of the day yeah. where I can't get home because it happens far too often. Yeah, that is something we hear a lot. I have some questions yeah. as we travel around. Never mind getting to London. We want to get across the country or to the nearest town more quickly. Um, Bridget, why isn't Barnsley considered priority one for levelling up funding? So that's basically why, yeah. why it's about the north-south divide and why aren't areas like this getting more money? Yeah, and... Um, you know, levelling up is, you know, something the government talk about an awful lot. Never been defined, for me, just a, a vacuous slogan where they take with one hand, pull vast sums of money out of communities like Barnsley, like Sunderland, where I'm from and represent, and then expect gratitude when they give a, a bit back, a couple of million quid here and there for a particular project. No one's ever going to say no. As a local MP, I'll always argue if there's money on the table, I'll bid for it, I'll argue for it. But when you look at the wider impact that we see, the, wide, the bigger decisions the government has taken on the economy, the impact that that has had means that we've got more children now growing up in poverty. So I want every child to have the best opportunity that modern Britain can give. But how do you have that opportunity if you're growing up in poverty? You're denied that opportunity, okay. that so chance for the future. So would you give more money to an area like Barnsley? And if so, where would you get it from? I want to see a 
much bigger and more fundamental change in the way that we do things in this country. So take our high streets, so important to a local economy. But we know that obviously we've seen a big change in the way that people buy, uh, the move to online. You know, that's quite right. But we need to level that playing field so we have a, have a much fairer system for our bricks and mortar businesses. So I want to see a big change around business taxation where it comes to business rates so that high streets can be properly competitive, can be that we can all be proud of the place that we're from. But, you know, giving a bit of money here or there and the government kind of doling it out on often what amounts to uh, far from transparent processes about how those decisions are being made is not the way to do it. Tim. Uh, Barnsley should be everyone's number one priority. That's, <laughs> that's an obvious. Um, I, I don't think this carrying favour is really going to work, work Tim. <laughs> Leveling level, up is a good idea in principle. The individual product, uh, projects can be very good. One thing that's really fallen behind in this country is infrastructure spending and particularly transport. It's in a creaky and terrible state. And it does feel like the things going wrong with airplanes and trains in the last few days are not just simply a hangover of COVID, but they actually feel like a system that's really creaking to the end uh, if it doesn't receive more investment. But I do think uh, governments have got to focus on macro macroeconomics and upon the fundamentals. They've got to get the fundamentals right. You can level up as much as you like in individual towns, uh, but if taxes are still too high, if levels of poverty are still too high, uh, then it, it makes minimal difference. Um, and two areas where we've really fallen behind in this country in the last 12 years are productivity uh, and also pay. We are low paid. Uh, we think we're a very rich country. We're, we were. We're falling behind, and our pay is now falling behind countries like Germany and France. Um, and until you get a government in there which really understands those basics and those fundamentals, then however much money you splash around here or there, I'm afraid it's, it's not going to address the really big issues of poverty and inequality. From there in the glasses. Thank you. Um, for, for me, this, this levelling up is OK to talk about for in the future and things like that, but things really need to start happening now. Mm. Um, local authority funding slashed. Social workers are on the knees. You've got young people getting moved out of the borough in schools. I've got friends that have got children and they're now... Um, getting on buses like 15 minutes to get to their local schools because we're overwhelmed. Population is growing and nothing's getting done. No new schools are getting built. New houses are getting built everywhere, which means more people are moving to the area, which means more things are getting overwhelmed, like health. Uh, no new doctor straight surgeries are getting built. It's OK talking about levelling up, but it's actually the, the foundation that we need to be speaking about. And it's, it's not changing, it's not happening, and it needs to be done now because people are, are really suffering. The man in the blue shirt. Yeah, I, agree with the, I agree with the young lady who's just spoken over there and Tim's original point and Fiona that we should be looking at uh, infrastructure and travel but not just putting the, uh, the, the, the facilities in place but also giving people the skills to be able to work on them and develop them in the north for the north. Yeah, and the woman there in the pink at the back. Why aren't we pushing the green economy more? The, there's an opportunity there that is, is waiting for us. Mm. Uh, it's something that has got to be addressed. Everybody pushes the uh, climate change to one side because it's always that bit further on. There's always some, emergent, um, some urgent matter that needs dealing with right now. But if we brought forward the green economy, then there'd be skills. Uh, people could be taught the skills to do that. And, you know, it's, it's time we do it. it OK. And the woman here in the front, in the black T-shirt. Deanna, you talk around skills. Mm -hmm. um, how are our kids going to get the skills mm -hmm. when they've not got access to youth clubs? Um, the local boxing gyms haven't got even funding from the government or anything like that. Cost of living for them and university fees, education, everything else is just a massive, massive factor, not just in Barnsley, but I think around the country. <coughs> Can't afford to go to university. You know, they're, they're coming out with 50 grand's worth of debt when they, when they finish the, the, the degree. Um, and I just think for our, our kids' future, future politicians and things like that, I think we need a, a different pathway for them. We need to support them a lot better. We've got about 10 seconds left in the Finish the third, I'm afraid, Jenna. Ten seconds to answer. There's a lot going on. T-levels, university technical colleges. I think we need to be pushing less kids into university, showing them there are other paths where they can work and train, not have to take on that debt at all, because build up the skills earlier. OK. I, 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 you've got two seconds. I've got to end the programme. Go on, very quickly. How are you, you going to show them a different path 
when they've not got access to youth clubs okay. or skills or anything like that within the area. I'm afraid I'm going to have to let you carry on this conversation on the programme's <laughs> over because our time is up. Apologies, but we, we only get an hour and our hour is up. So thank you very much to the panel. Thank you very much to all of you for coming here tonight from Barnsley. And of course, thank you to you at home for watching from Question Time in Barnsley. Bye-bye.